Good morning and welcome to this session on delivering future digital infrastructure. Um, I'm pleased to say I'm joined today by uh, three colleagues who are very much involved in this whole area. Uh, Jerem Clulo, who's the Digital Connectivity Manager from Nottinghamshire County Council. Uh, Jeff Connell, who's the Head of Information Development at Norfolk County Council. Uh, and from industry, Andy Tate, who's the Director of Civil Government Sales with UK Cloud. Now, of course, the, the last year has been an exceptional year uh, and has meant new challenges for all of us, not least for members such as myself, who have been used to doing things the same way for so many years. So what we're hoping to do in this is to look at what we've learned, but also looking forward, how we de deliver the future digital infrastructure. So I'd like to begin by, by asking our panel, um, how has the pandemic changed our approach to the provision of services? And will this change continue? Who'd like to start us off on that? Sharon? Yeah. Yeah. Morning, everyone. And um, thank you for having me today. Um, yes, definitely. It's already mentioned earlier this morning that we are experiencing one of the greatest challenges uh, and many of us have ever seen. Um, this is assumption of how we live and work and COVID-19 pandemic has had a severe impact on our social, economic and commercial institutions. Um, there has also been some considerable human impact of the pandemic as well. And this past few months have seen terrible loss of life, uh, while frontline and essential workers have worked tirelessly to keep vital services, industries and shops open. Looking first at how COVID-19 um, has affected local services to date, we have seen a removal of much of the previous organisational policy shift to digital. Probably it is the most significant shift to the digital we are likely to see in our lifetime. Um, councils that previously been resisting cashless payments, for example, but hold on paperless um, within weeks. We have also seen a major shift towards digital service delivery, with greater acceptance of data sharing, move to cloud and radical shift towards home-based working and move away from often huge meetings and becoming as a norm in so many of our councils. So innovation has accelerated. Um, we, uh, I am, um, I was involved in interested in tech as long as I can remember, and ensuring Robin Hood County, Nottinghamshire, is well connected and is a great place to live, work, visit. That forms part of my responsibility, which makes me uniquely qualified to be here today. And the importance of digital connectivity is increasing. It's more critical for our lives. But what we are looking as the council is, ever since the start of the pandemic as a local authority, we have been using our time wisely. Um, busy exploring best practice from elsewhere, uh, using available data to understand current and future challenges that our businesses and residents might face. And lastly, we are looking for how government policy is or is not currently responding to that. So whilst we know there are many challenges, um, we don't want to hide behind these or use them as an excuse because this will lose sight of so many opportunities. Thank you, Joan. Jeff. Jeff, uh, Norfolk, a very rural uh, county. Um, why has it taken us a pandemic to, to actually use things which have been around for some time? Well, I think what the pandemic's done is it's accelerated that digital change. Um, because of, uh, frankly, necessity. And it's interesting that certain things um, have probably benefited more than we expected. For example, adult learning, shifting all those courses online. Uh, what we found is that take up has massively increased, probably because people were, and, and the feedback we get is that people were struggling to get to these courses in the evenings, traveling across a large rural county, as you point out. So I think some of the things that we, we tried through necessity we found work well and we'll simply continue. Um, others are about prioritization and joint opportunities. So if you look at the integration of health and care and data sharing in particular, that was simply necessitated by the pandemic response. Um, and in particular, the, the vaccination efforts. Um, I don't know if it's probably worth us 
muting when we're not speaking because I'm not sure about you guys, but I'm getting quite a lot out of um, yes, reverb. I am. Yeah. Um, and there are things like you know the, the greener benefits of the uh, the digitization activities. So there are a number of upsides, um, but of course th there are difficulties, particularly with people suffering from rural isolation. They had that previously, but they have it even more now because of their digital isolation. So, um, yeah, I, I think one of the real upsides for me of this is that everybody has worked together across our places. So multi-agency working has been um, been improved. Uh, and what I, I hope most of all, of course, is post-pandemic, or as we start to unwind the restrictions of the pandemic, that we retain what we've learned, we've retained the good practice as we bring back in the best of the old. Um, that, that's my hope. As you're, you're muted. <laughs> Andy, um, how, how are you looking from, from, if you like, from the outside, from, from industry looking at the public sector? Obviously, we've seen uh, a massive drive towards um, you know, moving online and digitization of services. And, and that's from an operational perspective, that's uh, obviously given us some challenges. And we've been very much focused on how we can deliver those services, maintaining our you know, exceptionally high uh, operational availability, but also reducing the potential um, you know, risk associated with working together. So you know, we've, we've had to implement all of the social distancing uh, requirements both in the office working uh, and also in the, the data centers, recognizing that you know, we're running critical services um, for the public sector across the country, you know, from uh, security services to, to local authorities to, to health. Um, so it's been a, a really critical time. And at the same time, the drive to put more and more uh, services onto that uh, instantly available or recordable or, you know, uh, on demand type services has actually, you know, resulted in ever increasing workloads on, on our team to stand up new services. So it, it's been it's been a very challenging time, but you know, obviously, we're very excited to work with uh, the public sector and and help see that go forward. Uh, and and as we, we we come out of the you know the last year, and and as we've discussed, things get a little bit more back to normal. It's about making sure that we can drive through on the 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 other aspects, the social value uh, and the environmental aspects of this you know increased demand for services that will be at front of mind for us. Thank you. Um, Jaron and, and Jeff, what, what's been the most difficult area that you've had to deal with? And what do you think are some of the unresolved challenges that we've still got to do if we're, as we move forward? Um, very good question. Actually, this is uh, always a challenge. And I think I will start with, um, for example, our economic recovery and growth strategy sets out a clear vision. Uh, up to 2030. However, um, none of that could happen without the right investment in skills. So we want to build on our successes and align our educational skill system with business needs to aid their recovery interventions and support businesses to access the talent needed for the current and next generation of our industries. So upskilling is really important in this process. Um, what needs to be still resolved is the coverage of fixed and mobile connectivity. Um, again, we are doing really well with, with fixed broadband, super fast broadband. It's over 98.7% now has nothing which is super fast broadband. But with COVID-19, we've seen the demand that super fast over 30 meg is not enough anymore. We need to focus on gigabit speeds. We need to focus on full fiber speeds. So then big machines could be used, um, 5G needs to be expanded. Um, again, we do all ourselves as a local authorities to, to trial these new applications, like we, we are at the moment leading 5G connected forest, um, the world's 5G connectivity in Woodland, um, just to direct the demand to the rural areas. So in terms of your answer to your questions, um, connectivity is, what we need to resolve, expand, and we are working very closely with central government with planning gigabit program. But to support that, upskilling, 
preparing people to use those digital technologies next generation uh it's it's in our top of our list and if i can build if i can build upon that i would certainly yeah. agree that um business um, recovery and business growth supported by digital connectivity and skills is, is absolutely a crucial area uh, as we seek to rebuild. Um, but the uh, the bit that goes alongside that, of course, is digital inclusion for our, for our residents and particularly dis um, groups who are already digitally disadvantaged uh, or, or generally disadvantaged. So if I look back to January this year, when with one day's notice, we were told that the children would not be going back to school. Uh, we had to very rapidly mobilize a response to help um, Norfolk children to be able to learn from home. We didn't want them falling further behind through their digital exclusion. Um, and I was really proud that actually as a, a council working collaboratively with local charities and uh, other organizations and people like Lotus Cars, we managed to mobilize over 5,000 laptops in around about a month and deploy them to every single digitally disadvantaged child in Norfolk um, and also work to, to help them get the skills and knowledge they needed and support the schools as well. Um, and that was through a campaign called Every Child Online. And what I'm challenging myself and my team with at the moment is how do we take the energy, the enthusiasm, the, um, the group working that, that achieved that and roll that forward into digital exclusion, you know, challenging uh, and overcoming digital exclusion across the whole county afterwards, taking you know various other groups who are digitally disadvantaged. So how do we how do we build upon the reopening of the libraries network in particular to give people the the support they need to get them online? Because as I mentioned earlier, with um, shielding adults, vulnerable adults in particular, we recognise that that digital inclusion just really reinforced the negative impact of, of physical exclusion that they got through um, isolation. So that's that's a real focus area for me. Oh, Jeff, you've probably got the same sort of problems in, in Norfolk as we have in parts of Essex, where basically connectivity is very poor. Um, and I, ju I just wonder whether you feel that there is a mindset change that when we talk of infrastructure, we won't first of all be thinking of roads and rail, you know, Norwich to London in 90, but actually for... <laughs> For many, it will be, can I get a connectivity from the wilder parts of Norfolk or, or other areas? Um, well, do you think I've that message about, is getting home? I think it absolutely is. I've always talked about connectivity broadly, whereas connectivity is physical travel time and it's uh, digital travel. Norfolk doesn't have any uh, motorways and we don't really want any. But what we do want is the electronic equivalent. We want that gigabit speed connection. Um, and what I am seeing is... Um, massive investment, massive energy going into this. If I look back a number of years, um, probably only five years or so, Norfolk only had 42% super fast coverage. That's unbelievably bad. Uh, we're playing catch up. We're at 95 now, uh, not quite as good as Nottingham. Uh, I've got 10 million of investment going into um, full fiber connectivity right now. And we're amongst the first counties to be included in Project Gigabit investment so we're doing everything we can here and what i'm seeing is the demand from residents and businesses in particular growing rapidly and it was interesting that a few years ago you would see builders advertising double glazing on a new development they're now talking about fiber broadband connectivity so yeah i think that awareness really is raising andy um Jeremy mentioned upskilling um have we got sufficient skills both in the private and the public sector to meet this demand? So, so um, I mean, skills level is a particular challenge and, and we see this very much in uh, public sector organisations. I mean, we, we do a, uh, an awful lot of providing additional skill sets into organisations for short term projects. Um, it, it, and it, it's almost entirely around, uh, you know, digital infrastructure and digit digitization of projects so no absolutely it is a challenge and you know as as an organization we're doing a lot to try and encourage apprenticeships in uh, it related or um, uh, subjects uh, as well as you know bringing on um, young people into our organization ourselves to try and drive up those skill sets um, but i think it's a challenge we're going to be seeing you know for for a long time going forward i mean um 
for whatever reason, you know, some of the core IT subjects just, you know, are not exciting at, at a school level. And I think, you know, and I've seen that this with my my own kids, you know, uh, coming from an IT background, I've encouraged them towards the career path that's IT related and um, being unsuccessful so far in getting any of them to go in that direction. So, you know, I do I do think there's a challenge to how, you, you know, um, you know, the needs and our, our opportunity as a, a global player to be a leader in uh, technology. Um, we're really going to struggle without, you know, that level of um, new blood coming into the, the, the field. And Jeff, uh, how are you finding getting the right uh, human resources that you need? We were just chatting about that in the green room before we came in, actually. One of the things that has been good about um, recruiting during this pandemic period is that we've been able to recruit from much further afield because, of course, daily travel into the office uh, is no longer a requirement. Uh, and so we've had a, a wider pool of people um, to, to search across. So actually, we found recruitment has gone really well. Um, what we have also been conscious to do is to try to make sure we are bringing in a number of apprentices as well. I think we've got a, a duty to our local young people to give them opportunities to get their first work experience and particularly to get digital skills. If they stay with us, that's just great. And you know what, if they choose to move on, uh, I think that's great too, because actually they'll take that skills and knowledge and they'll take that out into the uh, local businesses uh, and hopefully bring us some tax income as well. Um, totally agree. And it's the same for us as well. We have been recruiting recently or over uh, this past year and um, using virtual uh, tools for interviews, assessment centers, inductions after they start to work. That definitely expands our geographic, wide geography area for who can apply. Uh, and also, um, that could again, connectivity is on top of everybody's uh, list because. Um, people from London, from Essex, can apply jobs in Nottinghamshire now. Um, the first thing they do is, do I connectivity in Nottinghamshire? Um, and do I get that flexible working opportunities? Um, we were discussing again, inductions uh, or team meetings are much easier. People don't need to commute, which will support productivity, uh, which is again one of the gains of uh, this new, new normal. Uh, how we can support our productivity by uh, using these um, applications, virtual um, tools. Um, we were discussing more people attending team meetings um, and have chance to have that um, access to, to services online uh, from wherever they are. Can I, can I just, in, in the last few minutes we've got, uh, look at it from our customer perspective, my constituents, uh, the local authorities, customers, and, and also, Andy, from, from, from your perspective. Um, there clearly is, uh, I mean, yes, there are the silver surfers. Um, you know, I'm sat here with three laptops, one from the county, one from the district, and my own. Um, but there are a lot of other people, yes, I know, but there are a lot of other people don't have access like that. Uh, and the you know, social uh, exclusion potentially for them, but also I think some concerns around the the privacy of the data and is it safe and and and, and that sort of thing. There's a there's an education process, isn't there, that we've got to got to carry out. Shall I shall I just start? Yes, whoever, yes, feel uh, free. From the the exclusion of or inequality of what's going on with um, reaching out to those. Um, vulnerable people is ex digitally excluded. So um, yes, definitely inequality of access to public services and um, lack of user voice is one of the weaknesses. And unless those weaknesses are tackled, the um, significant opportunities for these innovation in public service delivery, uh, which is developed since the beginning of this pandemic, may be lost. Uh, so what, what we do uh, in, in Nottingham as, as local authority, um, the, the Education, Learning and Skills Division has established a special project to manage emergency education related working during pandemic. And we work closely with schools, Department of Education and other partners to coordinate dispatch of laptops, 
uh, handheld devices, SIM cards, routers to target the children and young people across the county. Um, our main target is delivering connectivity-led growth to all parts of our, our region. Thank you. Um, Jeff, Andy, any thoughts? Yeah, I think I just, one thing I want to say on, on the tackling digital exclusion front is that for the first time ever, I've seen so many agencies pulling together to take on the challenge jointly. So I've got at least three schemes at the moment, which our local NHS are funding, um, using the libraries as, as hubs, um, getting um, devices out to people and developing support networks, but also creating that baseline so we understand who needs help, what sort of help and where. So that for me is a real big upside uh, of what's happened. Everybody understands the challenge and we're working jointly to address it. Andy, any, anything from your perspective? Yeah, very quickly, because I'm obviously conscious we're nearly uh, at close. I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're very much uh, happy to support, you, you know, that digital inclusion of everyone. Uh, there's, there's just always a concern around you know the, the vulnerability of certain people who potentially aren't yet you know aren't really ready or able to adopt a digital approach and so you know services still need to be able to be um accessed face to face now and i recognize that that percentage is a smaller percentage and is uh you know shrinking rapidly year on year but uh, you know we do we do need to be very concerned about the security of um, less capable people on the internet. Yes, I think um, I, I must admit from, from where I've sat though, there has been a, a huge uh, leap forward with, with many people. I mean, we had some members who didn't even have a, a computer in their house who are now happily Zooming and teaming. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but of course it's been because they've been forced to. Um, Indeed. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, necessity, they say, is the mother of invention. And I think that is exactly what Absolutely. we've we've got here. Well, we've only got the last 30 seconds. Can I can I thank uh, Ger and Jeff and, and Andy for a discussion which has just whizzed by? But hopefully, I think we've covered many of the, the challenges facing us uh, in delivering the digital infrastructure. I think the, the pandemic, um, one of the, the good things to come out of it, uh, has been this leap forward that we've now got. Uh, and I think we will need to keep that momentum going uh, in, in everything that we do. Can I thank you all very much for taking part? Thank you, thank Councillor. You. Thank you.